talking about vulnerable out of the box and evaluation of Android carrier devices. I'm sure that's going to be exciting right now. But here they are. Enjoy the con. All right. First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Ryan Johnson. I'm from CryptoWire, and I collaborated with Angelo Stavro for this research. So, why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, the short answer is to be proactive, look for vulnerabilities, responsibly disclose them to minimize any impact to the end user. So there's some recent examples for Android and on the right is uh, from the New York Times when we found that the New York or the number one selling unlocked smartphone on Amazon was sending the user's text messages and call log to a server in China every three days and it also had a command and control channel where it could execute commands is the system user. So you can see the Android software stack and mostly where we're going to focus is uh, up at the top at the pre-installed apps, also the Android framework and some system libraries. So anytime you have an Android device, there's going to be some pre-installed apps on there and they can run as soon as you turn the device on. Uh, some of these apps, uh, like platform apps and other pre-installed apps cannot be disabled, so if there's a vulnerability in them, you're kind of left to try and potentially root your device, assuming there's a root strategy available, and remove it or wait for a firmware update that fixes it. And some of the platform apps, they run as a system user, which is very privileged, so if there's a vulnerability in there, an attacker can get uh, some pretty nice capabilities. So some of these applications you know, can be, be malicious or insecure and Android vendors, when they take Android AOSP code, sometimes they customize it a little bit just to differentiate themselves and in doing this, they can introduce vulnerabilities. So here's a little primer on Android. Uh, when you're building an Android app, there are certain uh, functional blocks from which you can build your application. Uh, they're provided there and each of these can provide is a potential entry point into the application. Uh, when you create an Android application, you declare them in the Android manifest.xml file and you communicate with app components using intents, so that's just a framework uh, provided API class which serves as a message uh, to send to an app component and you can also embed data in them. So what makes an application component accessible or not to other processes on the device, it's regulated by two attributes that would be present in the application component declaration in the manifest file. Uh, so, and there are some instances where Android will by default export an application component, so if it doesn't use the Android exported uh, attribute and it contains at least one intent filter, Android will export this by default even though you didn't say set Android exported equals to true. So at the bottom there's a, a, a service that's being declared and this service uh, is exported by default and using it you can actually download and install an application. So here's the threat model. The, a low privilege third party app needs to be present on the device and this can reach the device either by repackaging, so taking an application, inserting code into it, putting it onto a third party market, phishing, sending it directly to the target, or remote exploit. We saw with the ADUPS command and control channel that that was over HTTP and using that you could just man in the middle it and say download this application, install it and run it or it could be part of a second stage exploit. Uh, generally uh, the attack the permission requirements are potentially no permissions or read external storage because read external storage, we've noticed that pre-installed applications, uh, some of them will just dump data to the SD card and so the, the application is a malicious app without malicious permissions that is leveraging uh, a pre-installed app, an open interface in the pre-installed app to get uh, some resources or capabilities that it cannot access directly. So here's a list of uh, some of the vulnerabilities we found. We processed more than 500 firmwares and it shows the device, the vulnerability as well as the carrier and we have a framework uh, scanning for vulnerabilities and a pipeline with additional vulnerabilities that haven't yet 
uh, been disclosed, and in this presentation, we're going to try and cover all of them. So, starting off with ZTE, we looked at a bunch of ZTE devices on carriers, and each ZTE device we looked at contained this vulnerability. So, you can see the devices at the bottom, and essentially, uh, any application uh, on the device can interact with a custom service that they have and have this service start writing the modem log and the logcat log to the SD card. And the logcat log, the system-wide one, is not directly accessible to third-party applications no matter what permissions they request. Uh, and when this logging is occurring, there's no vis visual or audible cue to the user that this is occurring. And it writes it to a base directory of just SD card, uh, SD underscore logs. So, here's some instances of things that we've seen in the logcat log. So, any process on the device can write any arbitrary message to the log. It's a shared resource. So, if you leak data there, it's going to show up in the log. The example up at the top right, that is from a Fortune 500 Android, uh, Fortune 500 Bank's Android app, and the device uh, or the application writes the user credentials to the log. Some devices we've seen have the messaging app in debug mode, so at that point you'll see the destination of the text message as well as the body of the text message. And we've also seen things like unique device identifiers, uh, user's email address, and GPS coordinates. So due to the log being a shared resource and that any application can write arbitrary data there, it was uh, moved from an application permission that a third party app could get to a system or platform permission in Android 4.1. Uh, here's a list of some devices uh, as well as the carrier and some unlocked devices where a third party application can have a pre-installed app on that device, start writing the log to a location, the system wide log to a location that it can access. And I've got a question for the audience. Uh, does anybody know how to interact with a bound service without the accompanying AIDL file? Okay. okay, so this is how it works on the ZTE device. There's a pre-installed platform app. Um, this app, uh, right after boot, registers itself as a custom service called modem service. The third party app says, give me a handle to this service. It gets the handle from the Android OS service manager. And this service that it obtains is like a mini service manager that offers, offers five services. So you get the uh, SD log service, and at this point, then you just call three functions, and it will start writing the logs, uh, the modem logs. And for this, it's specifically the modem log, although the logcat log is done in a very similar way, except just with a different service. And we have a, a video for that. So here, just going uh, terminal application, going to the SD card, uh, going to the directory where it writes them, just showing that it's not there. So for a third party application to actually access the modem log, which you know contains the user's text messages and uh, call data, they would need the read external, external storage permission uh, to access it. So just installing some app, it's gonna be done by an activity in the foreground. This could be done in the background by a service. Going back to uh, uh, the terminal, that directory should be there now. And the, the modem logs are actually in a QMDL file, which is a binary file. There is a program to access it, to parse it out. I don't have that program, but I can still um, identify uh, where the text messages are and show you in a slide soon. So here's the, the log cat log, which uh, they should have a file for four different log buffers. And it's just going to continue writing to them anytime the device is on. So just LSing uh, to show that the size is increasing. and then just catting it to show the contents of it. 
and then we'll go back to uh, the base directory to look at the QMDL file. Uh, we're unsure if this actually contains uh, voice data from the telephony, but it does contain the text messages and incoming and outgoing calls. So this just parsing the QMDL file, you can see the, uh, the text messages uh, in incoming and outgoing one, the phone number is in reverse byte order, and the actual body of the text message is in seven bit packed format. And so it's just a incoming and outgoing text message, and then just the calls that you make also show up in this QMDL file. And moving on, switching to LG, uh, we uh, have some vulnerabilities here. You can also obtain the system wide log cat log, except this you can get it written to the attacking application's private directory, uh, so you don't need any permissions, and you can see the device is affected. It's generally written to the SD card, but that you can use path traversal, and you can also inject a parameter uh, argument um, to the command that's ex being executed to get all of the logs. You can also lock the user out of their device, so a zero permission app can just send a, a single broadcast intent, and the screen lock will not let the user in. I'll show a video of that soon. There's another pre-installed app where you send it a broadcast intent and it, it's gonna write a database full that contains uh, snippets of the log cat log and the kernel log to external storage. So to get the system wide um, log cat log, there's a pre-installed app. It will execute the command that's shown in the first bullet. Uh, this, when you activate it by sending in an in intent, you can actually provide the path. Uh, there's the default path in the second bullet, so if you just do double dot slash four times, it takes you back down to the root directory, and then you just add on slash data slash data package name, uh, and then a file in your private directory, and at that point, that does require some file permission changes, which any app can do. You need to have the app's private directory globally executable, and you need to create that file, or create the file that you're gonna write to, and then make it globally writable. So this system process uh, can append to it, but you'll still own the file. And in the intent, you can provide an array list of strings, and in these strings, it's essentially just a log tag um, to add to the command, but, and it, and it appends a colon v to it just to give any log message at any log level for that log tag, but in red, if you just do the wildcard colon v, this will give you every single log message uh, in the log, and then space, and then any arbitrary word, and then that gets added to the command, and then it's gonna start writing the system-wide log cat log uh, to the attacking application's private directory. Uh, so you can also lock the user out of their device, so this makes the, the screen lock essentially unresponsive except for making emergency phone calls, and the, this is done, the system UI app has an exported interface where you send it a broadcast intent, and at this point, it's going to lock the screen, and this screen lock is active in safe mode, so in safe mode, third-party apps aren't running, but pre-installed applications are running, uh, but it reads from system UI app, will read from system settings and keep the lock in place. This sort of thing could be used for a cryptoless ransomware where you could provide messages at the bottom, uh, they're called toast messages, informing the user, you know, where to pay uh, to unlock it, and the user, if they have enabled ADB uh, prior to the screen lock attack, they can unlock it if they are crafty and look around, cha manually change the uh, settings, and, uh, or send a, a different broadcast intent to unlock it. So, have a video. So this just showing we have a screen lock on. and also LG patched all these vulnerabilities. So just a zero permission app, installing it, it should run for a second, and then the screen lock, you can't really do much with it, so unless, you know, you can figure, you have ADB enabled prior to that, and you can figure out how to do it, you're gonna have to boot into recovery mode and factory reset the device, potentially lose data to actually recover it.
So they're speaking of factory resets, we also found that a number of devices, some of them carrier, some of them unlocked, expose the capability to perform a factory reset. If you have an Android phone, you've potentially gone into the settings app and seen erase data. This, it will perform a factory reset. Um, this is generally done just by an exposed interface in a platform app where a zero permission app sends it a specific intent message and then it will programmatically go and wipe the device and any user data uh, that is not backed up somewhere will be lost. So if you've been playing a, a video game uh, for a long time, made a lot of progress, that's potentially gone, as well as uh, text messages and um, pictures. So we have a video for that. So this is uh, a T-Mobile Revel device and we're going to just install an application. It shows that it doesn't have any permissions there. So, and then it, it boots into recovery mode and then wipes the data in cache partitions. So this is kind of uh, the workflow to do it on uh, the essential phone. So just any uh, application on the device, it can have no permissions. It starts an activity, RT RTN reset activity. Uh, that's in a pre-installed platform app, which is very privileged. Uh, that activity then starts a, another activity, which is gonna send the master clear broadcast intent and this will be received by the system server process. The system server process provides uh, applications with all sorts of services. So the master clear receiver receives this, it calls an internal API class, uh, recovery system, and a method called re reboot wipe user data, and at this point it writes minus minus wipe underscore data, as well as a few things to uh, the, a file on the cache partition, cache recovery command, then boot, reboots into recovery mode, and then just wipes the data and cache partitions. So also, uh, we did find uh, arbitrary command execution as a system user through a vulnerable platform app on the Asus Zenfone 5 Live device. So we talked about the Android manifest XML file earlier. Here's the entire uh, manifest file for the application. So in red, just showing that it's a platform app running a system, blue is a package name, red is exported, meaning any application can interact with it, and orange is the name of it, and the service declaration is provided in bold. Um, so this is a bound service, we don't have the AIDL file, but this can be found out by looking at the, the uh, stub class and the stub proxy class uh, for the service, so you know, usually if you had the AIDL file, you could use some RPC, which would make it easy, but since you don't, you have to go one level down, actually get the uh, iBinder reference, call the correct uh, function number for it, and populate any parameters in the parcel. So here it's just writing a string to the parcel, uh, also using one uh, flag one way, so it's asynchronous and doesn't block. And here are some of the capabilities once you have arbitrary command execution as system user, uh, what you can do. And we have a video for that. So here, just going to the applications that are installed, it's called DEF CON 26. You'll see that it doesn't have any permissions. Uh, click around on it for a little bit. So there's a nice little menu. Uh, if you wanna obtain the user's text messages, uh, uh, you can. Uh, the way it's being done takes a little bit and I'll explain why. So just getting the user's contacts. Uh, looking at the call log, also this application, uh, 
has the code to be a notification listener embedded in it, so it can obtain the user's notif active notifications, receive them when they come in. It can go uh, take a screenshot, so um, that shows up in the application's uh, directory. You can also, this application has the code from the spelling checking framework. It, it implements a spell checking service. So at this point, when the user's typing something, uh, and it doesn't work in all applications, uh, only when the spell checker kicks in, but you can kind of see uh, what they type and also record a video of kind of what the user's doing. So here, just playing some game and trying not to die. Also, this application, uh, if you want to implement a keyboard on Android, it's called the input method editor. So the previous keyboard was actually the standard looking keyboard. It has the code to be an input method editor, so it's going to change the settings to set itself as the keyboard. So the keyboard's going to look different. I mean, if you wanted to be malicious, you would want to try and have it match the default keyboard. Uh, but the, the keyboard you'll see soon will be blue. So it's going to swap the keyboard. It's, this, it just writes some changes settings to have the keyboard uh, be the one that it's implemented in its code. And then any key codes that are pressed are going to be transferred to the malicious app via a dynamically registered broadcast receiver. And this will get something, you know, everything that you type. So it's going to type something, delete it, um, and then type something else and then just keeping a log of what the user typed. And then calling 911. Which if you can do, I, talked to a, a nice gentleman who was kind of understanding about it once I explained why I was doing it. So we also, once we saw that on uh, ASUS devices, we, uh, they provide actually the firmware on their website and also historical firmwares. So we downloaded a bunch just to see what was vulnerable and also the, we also found that tablets had this vulnerable platform app. Uh, then we also wanted to find out when it was introduced. So we focused on one device, which was the ASUS Zenfone 3 and saw that it was introduced around March 2017, and then it further got introduced into all other markets uh, except for China, which was uh, just stated Android 6.01, which is a non-vulnerable version. And this is a non-US uh, carrier device, but it's a device that's uh, popular in Asia. It's called the Oppo F5, and this vulnerable ability has been patched and they also went and after this became uh, a CNA, uh, which we thought was a very good thing. So there's uh, an application uh, on here, which is a very simple application. Uh, we took the ODEX file and then provided uh, the source code for it. So essentially it just has a thread and it will take a string and then execute it as the system user. and on the lower right is actually just the code to um, execute it. So um, another question for the audience. So does anybody have a good way, if you just have access to runtime exec, to make the vulnerable app write a script and then execute it? Okay, so what we did, one of the devices we looked at actually the platform app, the SE Linux rules prevented the platform app from reading and writing from an untrusted third-party third app's private directory, although all the other devices allowed that, but this device uh, prevented that. So uh, just using runtime exec is kind of limiting. We would, you know, want to have some logic in there as well as some output redirection. So the approach that we came up with to do that is just to select a string with high entropy and then in the attacking app create a uh, dynamically register a broadcast receiver that has an action string of that uh, high entropy string 
and then from there start writing to the log using a log tag of that high entropy string, and then each log message contains one line of the shell script to execute. You can see it um, uh, at number two. Uh, from there, since you have command execution, you make it execute the command in bold. So this makes it, uh, there's a bunch of parameters to it, so it's just a log cat command. Minus V raw just gets you the actual log messages as opposed to the log tags and any timestamp stuff. Minus S silences every other tag except the one that you want, which is that high entropy string at any log level. Minus F writes the log messages to a shell script in the vulnerable app's private directory, and then minus D makes it dump the log as opposed to keep reading from it. So it just dumps a log buffer. So that's gonna write your script to the vulnerable app's private directory, and then you just change the file permissions on it and then execute it. And the example here is just to get the text messages, write it to a file in its private directory, and then send uh, that file using uh, a broadcast intent and embedding it in there to the, the attacking apps, uh, to the attacking app. And then if you relax some of the conditions, if it can write um, to the, vul the a vulnerable platform app, if it can write to the third party app's private directory, then you can just have it uh, write directly in there with the text messages shown here. And that it requi requires the file permission changes that I mentioned earlier, making the attacking apps uh, private directory globally executable and creating an empty file and making it globally writable. Uh, so Oppo does provide the firmwares on its website, at least the most recent one, so we downloaded some of those just to see uh, what's vulnerable. It's segmented by country market. And we downloaded more, except they use an OZIP format, which uh, is, you know, encrypted. Uh, we were able to get some of them. Uh, but not all of them. And this table is ordered um, chronologically with most recent first. And if, if you do have command execution as a system user, if the, if the attacking app implements an IME or a spell checker, those are just the commands to actually change it in settings. Uh, the platform app has the privileges to change system settings. Uh, so we have a an analysis framework. Uh, we have something called force path execution, which will, you know, take a firmware, unpack it, and then process all of the apps in parallel. And the force path execution, it, it can actually force into certain branch constraints, just in case there's any triggered functionality to try and make the application uh, show all of its behavior under, you know, any circumstances. We also do some static analysis, some tain analysis to see if there's any vulnerable flows to see if there's, uh, you know, say the, obtaining the user's text messages to see if that flows to a network socket. And then also using a custom Android build where we control the, the framework key, we can uh, perform some hooking uh, at the framework level and also hook some of the library calls, uh, see how the application is interacting with the system and man in the middle of the traffic. And we have a video. So we, there's uh, three vulnerable platform apps that have command execution as a system user. So just uh, performing some taint analysis, uh, building the control flow graphs, also the data flow graphs, and then looking to see if there's any paths in data that actually flow from the application entry point uh, to runtime exec or process builder to see if there's, you know, any vulnerable uh, or any paths as well as the path condition, so what it would actually take to uh, reach that path. Uh, we also found that uh, certain devices have the capability um, where a third party app can initiate the taking of a screenshot. So this uh, is generally from system server uh, being modified, there will be a a broadcast receiver where if you send it a specific intent message, um, it will uh, uh, 
uh, take a screenshot, and if an application has read external storage, it can read from the SD card, also expand the status bar to see what the user's current notifications are, and this sort of thing isn't transparent uh, to the user so they can see it, but an application, uh, if, if it knows the user hasn't been using the device for a while, it can, even though there's a screen lock, come into the foreground, bring down the notification bar, take a screenshot, and then use a generic attack to soft reboot the device uh, to get rid of the notification. So we have a video uh, showing that. So there's an active screen lock on the device. Uh, the application runs, takes a screenshot, shows up in the application's uh, image view. And then it, it's going to uh, cause a system crash because that screenshot does leave a notification so it wants to remove that, not to alert the user. Uh, we also uh, found uh, an application on uh, certain devices which allows any third party application without any permissions to send text messages, read text messages, modify them, and also obtain the phone numbers of the user's contacts. Uh, the package names are provided there. One of the package, uh, package names is actually just a refactored version of the other, so the namespace is a little different, but the functionality's the same. And uh, this is a platform app that can't be disabled. So uh, looking at the manifest file for the application, the receiver up at top in red, uh, it's exported, and if you send an intent message with the correct fields that it's looking for, such as the message to send and the phone number to send to, it will go on and send a text message for you. And there's also seven content providers which are exported, and that's usually kind of strange behavior uh, a little bit because they tend to contain uh, they're a repository for data, so that opens it up to any process on the device, and they actually act as a wrapper. So you can query this content provider, it's going to query the text message content provider, get the results, pass that back to you. So moving on to the ZTE ZMAX Champ device, so there's a pre-installed platform app here which will just allow any application on the device to cause a factory reset resulting in potential data loss for the user. There's also a way to get the logcat logs and modem logs that were described previously. And you can also, if you have just the standard uh, zero per permission third party app, uh, just with a standard template with all the callbacks, you can make this device non-functional with essentially one line of code by sending a, a broadcast intent um, to a specific app, and we have a video showing that. So this is the ZTE ZMAX Champ device. We're gonna install an application on it. I got to allow uh, third party sources. So it doesn't have any permissions, that's what that screen shows. I'm gonna cancel that. So this application is just going to send a single broadcast intent message with a particular action string. It's going, I'll explain the workflow in the next slide, but essentially what's going to happen is it writes a certain uh, value to a file that's going to be processed in recovery mode, and as far as we can tell, it's going to encounter a fault, boot back into recovery mode, encounter the same fault, um, while trying to erase it, and it appears this is due to them using a non-AOSP um, command in recovery, which I'm not sure if it is just not handled, but essentially that device will just keep doing that until it runs out of battery and we weren't able to find a way to boot into an alternate mode 
uh, at that point. So here's the workflow for it. It's just a, you know, a zero permission uh, third party app on the device. It sends a broadcast intent message. There's a, an application uh, that has hidden menu in the package name and usually those are apps you want to look at. So it sends that broadcast intent, it receives it, and then it's going to go on and send a different broadcast intent and it's called master clear data carrier. This again is going to be received by the master clear receiver that's in system server. At this point it calls a non AOSP API method uh, call in recovery system called reboot wipe user data and carrier. It writes that file uh, shown in step five. There's minus minus wipe carrier which uh, is not part of AOSP and then it's going to write it to that file, reboot into recovery and then it's going to go into recovery and just perpetually crash in recovery mode. So here's uh, moving to uh, Alcatel. This is an unlock device. This uh, was sold a while ago as an Amazon Prime exclusive, so it would have some of the Amazon apps on there and be at a discounted price. And this device allows read only properties to be modified at runtime, which is not the standard behavior. So if you have uh, ADB enabled, you can execute those commands below, just setting RO debuggable to one, and then RO secure to zero, and then ADB root, that's going to restart ADB daemon running as root as opposed to ADB shell and then disabling SE Linux and then at that point you have a root shell. Uh, one thing we noticed on this device, we looked at the initRC file which contains commands for uh, the init process to execute and there's a directive so if RO debuggable gets sent to one to start a process, this process is the BTW LAN daemon and uh, it will go on and start a binary called factory test that's running as root. So once that property gets changed, that, uh, that process starts executing as root and it essentially its function is to listen to commit, listen, uh, creates a socket, you know, you can send to the socket commands and it will execute them as root. We weren't able to do that from a third party application. Um, but we did notice that app, uh, platform apps actually can modify that permission at run, or that property at runtime to make that uh, socket show up. We're unsure if sys platform user can actually write to it, but um, the vendor contain controls the SE Linux rule, so if they wanted to, they would be pretty close to uh, getting uh, command execution as root. And uh, just kind of uh, to conclude, uh, many of these vulnerabilities were just uh, done by insecure access control. So there were a lot of exported components which, um, you know, don't necessarily need to be open to every uh, third party application on the device. Also, if you're an app developer, you don't want to assume that, you know, just because an application doesn't have the AIDL file for the bound service that they can interact with it, uh, somebody will be able to figure that out and, uh, you know, access it. If you are executing commands as a system user um, and somehow that gets exported, you would at least want to filter commands just so it's not any arbitrary commands, only actually what's needed. And uh, just uh, from the responsible disclosure process, uh, all of these vulnerabilities were responsibly disclosed, although sometimes it's difficult to find, you know, who exactly to talk to, who's going to escalate it quickly. Uh, so if there was a, a common email address to send to, uh, that would facilitate things. And also, um, we have a report. If you're interested, uh, send us an email. And does anybody have any questions? I didn't look at any OnePlus devices. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the question was if we looked at any OnePlus phones because they actually have the parent company 
uh, is I think BBK Electronics, which owns Oppo, Vivo, and OnePlus. Uh, but, and, uh, like, we haven't uh, looked at OnePlus devices. One of the things that I want to point out is that the devices that you saw today are a small sample of the devices that we have identified as being vulnerable. Clearly, the, the length of the talk does not allow us to talk about all the devices that we have found, but there were more than 26 devices that we have currently identified that disclosed as part of the report, and we have an ongoing pipeline of devices that we have identified uh, that are vulnerable, and we're in the process of disclosing it to the vendors. The, the key here is that uh, a lot of the devices come with a lot of the a lot of the OEMs uh, have vulnerabilities that the devices come from the factory directly to the user. And these, these, these vulnerabilities cannot be disabled by the end user even if they identify that their phone is vulnerable. And I think that's the important part here. Uh, the question is if the the essential phone is specific to Sprint? No, it's not specific. No, no, uh, and again, the reason that we have some of the phones are tied to car carriers is because we wanted to show that basically that's not a, not a specific carrier problem or specific OEM problem, but it's a pervasive problem across multiple carriers and the industry needs to be looking at that as a whole rather than, you know, specific carriers. So this is a, the answer to that is no, and the reason is because this type of, we, we looked at over 500 firmware, we didn't have, this is the first uh, initial preliminary, I would say, presentation for the study. We do believe that uh, there are other vulnerabilities, so if you don't see a phone here, it doesn't mean that we looked at it and it's not vulnerable. We had limited the uh, amount of time, and, uh, and you remember that all of these, devices were disclosed 60 days. So between the 60 days prior and now, we have more devices identified, which we cannot disclose here, but they're still vulnerable. I, I didn't hear the question, go ahead. Uh, question. Yeah, we weren't aware of that at the time, but uh, thanks for letting us know. So, so I want to point out that the disclosure happened not only to the OEMs, guys. The disclosure happened to Google and to the carriers themselves. So it's not that we tried very hard to reach out to the responsible parties and have these, uh, these firmware spots ahead of our presentation. So basically, we don't put people in harm's way. Uh, and most of the vulnerabilities is somehow being either addressed or there is a fix uh, prepared. Some of them are not, but this is completely up to the OEMs and the carriers to that process to proceed. Yes. Yep. Uh, I mean, I've got a kind of a history with Samsung. I mean, they've given me, you know, a bug bounty, a free phone. I presented at Black Hat uh, Asia 2015 for them. So, uh, so the short answer is that we are in the process of looking into more devices. Some of them might be vulnerable, some others are not. We cannot disclose anything today more than what we disclosed because we are in the uh, 60 to 90 days disclosure process that we have established with the OEMs. I don't know if we can, we can't speak for Google. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you, can, uh, you can directly uh, address the question directly to Google. I think, uh, I think they're trying hard to help with the ecosystem security, but I mean, we cannot answer for that. If there are more, no more questions, thank you very much. Okay.